Hi there, welcome to Can You Feel It? This podcast aims at expanding our intellectual horizons. I am Jeanne Proust, and I'd like to pull philosophy down from its academic ivory tower by deciphering and discussing philosophical texts and ideas with you. Let's instill some thinking in our life to better feel and philosophize around. In this episode, we'll explore what the word normal means. We'll also discuss the relationship between disease, disability, and health. It is true that in medicine, the normal state of the human body is the state one wants to re-establish. But is it because therapeutics aim at this state as a good goal to obtain that it is called normal? Or is it because the interested party, that is the sick man, considers it normal that therapeutics aim at it? We hold the second statement to be true. We think that medicine exists as the art of life because the living human being himself calls certain dreaded states or behaviors pathological, hence requiring avoidance or correction relative to the dynamic polarity of life in the form of a negative value. Being healthy means being not only normal in a given situation, but also normative in this and other eventual situations. What characterizes health is the possibility of transcending the norm which defines the momentary normal, the possibility of tolerating infractions to the habitual norm and instituting new norms in new situations. Health is a margin of tolerance for the inconstancies of the environment. But isn't it absurd to speak of the inconstancy of the environment? This is true enough of the human social environment where institutions are fundamentally precarious, conventions revocable, and fashions as fleeting as lightning. But isn't the cosmic environment, the animal environment in general, a system of mechanical, physical and chemical constants made of invariance? Certainly this environment, which science defines, is made of laws. But these laws are theoretical abstractions. Here is how the environment is inconstant. Its inconstancy is simply its becoming, its history. For the living being, life is not a monotonous deduction, a rectilinear movement. It ignores geometrical rigidity. It is discussion or debate with an environment where there are leaks, holes, escapes and unexpected resistances. Health is a regulatory flywheel of the possibilities of reaction. Life is usually just this side of its possibilities, but when necessary, it shows itself above its anticipated capacity. To be in good health means being able to fall sick and recover. It is a biological luxury. Inversely, disease is characterized by the fact that it is a reduction in the margin of tolerance for the environment's inconstancies. The healthy man does not flee before the problems posed by sometimes sudden disruptions of his habits, even physiologically speaking. He measures his health in terms of his capacity to overcome organic crises in order to establish a new order. Man feels in good health, which is health itself, only when he feels more than normal, that is, adapted to the environment and its demands, but normative, capable of following new norms of life.
I just read excerpts from the normal and the pathological, an essay written by Canguilhem based on his 1943 thesis, and Canguilhem then added new chapters in 1966 and published then this book, which became one of the most crucial contribution to the history of science in the last half century. Canguilhem analyzes the way in which health and disease were defined in the 19th century, showing that the emerging categories of the normal and the pathological were far from objective scientific concepts. Where does this interest for defining and interrogating the word normal come from? I wrote my PhD thesis on the history of psychology in Europe in the 19th century and early 20th century, and I'm not going to try to summarize 450 pages right now, I will spare you that, but one of the topics I focused on had to do with the relationship between the normal, the healthy, and the pathological, the abnormal. Biology always fascinated me, and specifically teratology which is the study of monsters. Terra in Greek means monster. It's a fascinating discipline in medicine and biology. The study basically of birth defects and their causes, of abnormal development and congenital bodily malformations, abnormal growth in animals and plants. I always asked myself, while being fascinated, why I was so fascinated, why people in general, at least the ones who deem themselves normal, are fascinated by the monstrous. Like certain kids, for instance, when they stare shamelessly at a person with a big nose, or for instance, you know, as a personal example, I remember the guilty cravings. I had to look at the foot of one of my great grandfathers who was in World War II and lost half of his foot. I also worked for various associations supporting physically and mentally impaired people back in France, and that was probably one of the richest and most humbling thing I did. And on a more conjectural note, we keep hearing how people can't wait to go back to normal after COVID, as if we were to return to a lost Eden. So all these reasons pushed me towards having an episode on that notion of normalcy, of normality. Is normal better than abnormal? What is the normal state of a human organism or of a society? What is health and disease? What is a disability? What does it mean to be normal? So if we look at the origins of the word, the Latin word norma means rule, and it mostly refers to a carpenter square. So here, in the very origin of the word, you have both a descriptive and a normative connotation. So we're referring here to a tool to straighten, right? The carpenter square is here to straighten something, to make something straight. But our modern notion of normal came from the medical domain. The normal state of an organism was always paired with a pathological state. Auguste Comte introduced the term to sociology and he borrowed the word normal from medicine, namely a guy named Brousset, and identified it with order and progress. Comte's notion of normal was both conceptualized as an average or factual state on the one hand and as a desirable state on the other. This ambiguity still underlies in our understanding of that notion, whether we look at the individual normal state of a person or at the social norms at play within communities, dictating who is normal and who isn't. Comte blurries the distinction between fact and value. We can use the word normal either to say how things most commonly are or how they ought to be. So either the word normal means what is done by most people, the usual, the regular, the typical or average thing, what is statistically factual, or we can use it to say what is right, the standard we should seek. And subreptively, what is factual in the word normal, that corresponds to the average, becomes also what is right. And indeed, it becomes an obsession in sciences, in biology, but also psychology and sociology. Whenever investigating human nature, it became also about establishing what is normal behavior, normal personalities, normal relationships, for instance. 
A friend of mine asked me lately if I found it normal for a five-year-old to masturbate. And I answered her, well, are you expecting me to tell you that I heard about many other similar situations? And would that be reassuring to you? Or are you expecting me to tell you if I deem it morally permissible or a good thing for a five-year-old to masturbate? It's two different things. Another example comes to mind when I've been told many times in more or less subtle ways that I am not really normal for not wanting children. And while I don't really care, I can't help but thinking that there is a bit of judgment in that. It's not only stating that I am not just like the vast majority of women. It is hard to determine what the norm exactly is when we say someone is psychologically normal or socially normal. According to whom? In which context? For which community? In what times? Normalcy is obviously context-dependent. The historical context, the cultural context, definitely matters in our assessing what normal is. Norms provide social coherence and organization within a specific group or culture, resulting then in the marginalization of those who don't fit within that norm. The political and economical and technological and medical authority decides what is to be called normal and condemns what deviates from it as strange, queer at best, or dangerous, perverse at worst. But can't we also observe, especially in societies promoting individualism, a praise for anti-conformism? Yes, the praise for normalcy needs to be nuanced. We often hear injunction actually to be different, to be yourself, right? We sometimes applaud deviations from the norm, especially if the norm or the normal is regarded as coming from a conservative outside or external norms coercing the individual who is expected to just conform blindly to them. And here we are facing another connotation of the word normal, namely boring, in a way. When we hear people saying, don't be normal, for instance, I had this friend who was dating a guy and said that he was too normal for her. He had a normal life, a boring life, namely, for her. So this injunction to not be normal can actually also take the form of a peer pressure. It's yet another form of conformism, a sort of anti-conformist conformism. So one trivial example that comes to mind here are tattoos that were, you know, that used to be the sign of some toughness and were definitely transgressive. And now, you know, you, you walk in the street in Brooklyn and if you don't have a tattoo, you are the one out of the box for sure. So this injunction to be outside of the box, to be creative, heterodox, might take the form at first of an uncanny elitism against mainstream culture, against a normal that is only average and you know, standard routine or unremarkable commonplace. But it is also normative in the sense that it dictates rules that can actually feel just as heteronomous, namely coming from social pressure as old norms. It seems that the word normal has this performative function as both an invitation to preserve what is and as a repoussoir. A deterrent. A provocation for eccentricity, originality, pushing the individual to stand out of the crowd, which we always end up doing collectively, introducing then new anti-norms norms. Transgression indeed not only needs the norm to even exist, because it is defined by contrast with the norm, but it then ends up mutating into a new norm. So not only do we observe a relativity of social norms synchronically in space between different coexisting cultures, eating a different way, interacting in a different codified way, that's what we call basically cultural relativism. So not only what is normal depends again on geographical cultural context, but there is also a diachronic relativity. The norms change through time, they evolve all the time. The normal is changeable, inconstant. And we can question the value of that change. 
Perhaps what makes a healthy social group is precisely its ability to change, to not preserve obsolete traditions for the sake of it. And that leads me to Canguilhem's text. This mutability or fluidness of norms is not only obvious culturally and historically, but it also is the case for him on a physiological or biological level. My name is Donna Billick, and I'm currently in a small little town called Todo Santos at the end of the Bajas, and I um, have a destination workshop for art creating art called Todos Artes. Uh, prior to where I am right now, I was up in uh, Northern California at the University of California, Davis, and co-created with Dr. Diane Ullman an art science fusion program where for 20 years we explored the, the junction or the border between arts and sciences and did creative projects, both music and photography, mosaics, ceramics, and painting. So all of those mediums were employed. Uh, that sort of dovetailed into a 40-year uh, career creating large-scale public art in the Northern California and the United States and uh, Europe. Talking about normal in association with judgment is kind of something that when you start living, um, you start finding that there are these social agreements about how you can behave normally. Avoid getting injured or arrested and, and you're, you're in a good range. Uh, so those are, it, it's, normal can be guardrails in any culture, in any place or space that you're at. And noticing those and, and staying within it can, can really serve you. For me, when you get any deeper than that, uh, I find that the context of normal uh, doesn't serve me in that it is more subjective in the way I relate to myself than it is objective. So when normal doesn't serve me to balance out my life or, or direct me in a, in a way that uh, enhances my well-being, then I kind of reject norm and I'm not really uh, trying to do any homework to find out how I can behave in a way that's more uh, appropriate for someone else's standards. So so then you're, you're, you're basically on your own to find out what does normal mean? What is normal for me? Uh, would be something you'd have to be very meditative or in tune with uh, yourself on a daily basis and the rhythms and the things that you produce. And I think you can set up your own little guardrails about uh, how you can make uh, your own normal serve you and uh, become confident that way so that when the outside world makes great big shifts and changes and challenges you from the standpoint of whether you should accept uh, minorities or transgender or lesbians or those are all, those are all uh, things that are being challenged by old norms. So um, the, the moving into a normal way of being is a, an entire um, episode of connecting with something that you like, doing it, relaxing, and then, then noticing, oh, this is a really good behavior for me to normally do because it, it, it supports me. And then you can start filling in, what is my intention once I've found a norm that works for me? What is, what is the intention to what I want to bring to the group around me? Um, so I think that having your sort of self-reliant uh, form of normal is is a, a more supportive and less judgmental way to move. When I think of normal, I think of the middle of the playing field. And when I think of uh, falling too far 
down. I think of the dark side or, or illness, things that my body and my spirit will tell me, you are off the rails. So I can put my own rails down, and the way I'm able to do that is to get a feedback from my body, and I, uh, I know when I'm at, not at ease. And I know that what that ultimately leads to, if I don't attend to truing it, is disease. I wrestle with normal and a social uh, psychological reference because I don't agree to being judged. I'm too old. <laughs> What is normal then, according to Canguilhem? For Canguilhem, there is no objective, definite normal. One question we could ask ourselves to get into Canguilhem's work is the following. Is it normal to be sick or to not feel well? Well, sure, everyone is sick at some point in their life. But at the same time, when you are sick, you are not in your normal state. Your body doesn't function the way it usually does, and it is being experienced as something negative. What is this normalcy then about being sick? Are there perhaps several normalcies? Canguilhem identified the ambiguity of the word normal we spoke about earlier, between the quantitative statistical sense, which is descriptive, what is the most frequent, what is the most common is normal, and the qualitative prescriptive sense, which uh, leans towards a value where normal is an ideal prototype, a perfect version, a form or something. Canguilhem doesn't want to just note this ambiguity. He wants to question the origins of this ambiguity and to challenge the ethical judgment behind it. His first point is to establish a definition of life. Life is not just about maintaining norms. It is also about inventing new norms to adapt to the modifications of the environment in which a body is situated. This capacity that life has to invent norms is what Canguilhem calls the normativity of life. Life is essentially this normative activity, this ability to transform norms and create new ones. Life is fundamentally creation, newness, alterity. It creates new norms to make sure the organism is adapted to both the external environment and the internal events happening within it. Canguilhem refused to conceive organisms on the basis of mechanical models that would reduce basically the organism to a machine. He suggests a holistic view where the organism is way more than just the sum of its parts and he pays more attention to the organism's relation to the milieu, the environment in which it lives and its successful survival in this milieu. So we have to account for the particularity of organisms and for the complexity of life. What was Canguilhem's conception of organic life? One dogma to avoid, according to Canguilhem, is to consider that diseases or unhealthy states are just an augmentation or a diminution of the healthy state. According to this biology or medicine dogma, the normal or healthy state remains the standard in comparison to which we observe deviations in excess or deficiency that we call unhealthy or abnormal. Canguilhem is challenging this principle according to which diseases are merely the effect of simple quantitative changes in intensity. Bruce's principle has this principle of continuity at its core, where pathology is not really different in kind from the normal, because nature makes no jumps. It is just different in degree. So what's the problem with that? Well, first let's look at the advantages. We could say that, well, then the pathological is homogeneous with the normal, so there is no radical monstruosity. But it also insists on the fact that the healthy or normal state is to be found in a sort of mean that we ought to conform ourselves to. 
It also assumes that there is only one unique normal state, universally recognizable. There is, in other words, a uniformization of the normal. And then again, the question is, who gets to decide what is the standard we ought to conform ourselves to? The healthy state is the center, the paradigm, the referent in Bruce's principle. And the pathologies are only thought in reference to that paradigm. That is, to Canguilhem, a very narrow, reductive conception of life as an homogeneous order. Instead, Canguilhem suggests to reconsider what is pathological or unhealthy or abnormal as an irreductible plurality of alternative forms or expressions of life and not as mere excess or deficiency deviances from the paradigmatic healthy state. Canguilhem wants us to switch from the supposed objective, scientific, medical perspective to the subjective perspective of the patient. He wants us to be able to describe the qualitative and not quantitative distinction between the patient's normal state, as it is being experienced by the patient, and the state they feel while being sick. Being sick can actually be felt as yet another type of life, another allure, as he calls it, a look or a bearing of life, a way of being where the normativity we talked about earlier, the capacity to create new norms, becomes restricted. The unhealthy state is not a state deserted by norms. It has its own norms, but they are less flexible. They are restricted. What happens in disease is that the normativity is less active. To be sick for Canguilhem is to feel abnormal, not because we are subjected to no norms at all, but because we subjectively feel a lessening or a weakening of normativity. What we call the normal state is our normative power, this capacity to create norms, and it depends on the individual and on the ways the individual feels subjectively, the state they are in, on their very idiosyncratic reaction. Canguilhem comes up with a clarifying distinction between anormal and anormal, so anormal and abnormal. The anomal is just a statistical exception. It doesn't have any pejorative connotation to it. And it is not necessarily pathological. It just, you know, deviates from the average. The abnormal, by contrast, is what is incompatible with life continuing, what is compromising the stability of an organism and its ability to be flexible and creative into creating new norms, this normativity we talked about. An anomaly is not an abnormality. Diversity does not signify sickness. But careful, as Canguilhem uh, says again, en matière de normes biologiques, c'est toujours à l'individu qu'il faut se référer. This is a famous quote, which I'm going to translate by, in terms of biological norms, we always have to refer to the individual. The problematic state has to be evaluated by the patient themselves, who is the only person able to perceive and assess the qualitative alteration they're going through. A doctor, in that sense, has no right to declare an individual abnormal or sick without taking into account their point of view about their own state. So looking at extraordinary anormal biological data is not enough to declare a state abnormal. The healthy state is not something generally or universally definable. It is the ability to be creative when facing the changes of our environment. It echoes what we call homeostasis, which is defined by the tendency towards a relatively stable equilibrium between elements, especially as maintained by physiological processes. Canguilhem thinks in terms of normativity. It is not a state, it is both an effort to maintain an inner balance despite external changes, and the movement of adaptation or modification or inner reorganization to react when facing change. 
So that has consequences on how we treat disease and what do we even call curing. To cure, to heal, is not anymore to long for the state preceding the disease, what we wrongly consider the normal state. To cure is to help the body readapt to new given circumstances that call for novel norms. It also has consequences on the way we perceive disability. And we'll get to that in our next episode. The word normal is tricky deceptive and also a powerful ideological tool. It looks like some sort of magic word closing the gap between fact and value, between what is the factual average and what ought to be the ideal to attain, or for anti-conformist as a mainstream to avoid. With Canguilhem, we saw that the two antithetic concepts of the normal and the pathological are not objective scientific concepts. They are either, on a social level, political constraints imposed from the outside upon the individual that is required to conform, or, on a biological level, subjective evaluations of our individual ability to adapt and keep on living. Looking at the meanings of the word normal can help us reshape the way we look at the different, the disabled, the dysfunctional, and challenge the deeply rooted negative connotations these words have in our language. Thank you for listening to Can You Feel It? a podcast where we explore the world with a philosophical lens. Many thanks to my partner Johnny Nicholson for producing, recording and editing the podcast, as well as composing all of the music. Stay tuned for the next episode.